Are you ready? Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, we are in the thick of things finally for the NHL season, and I'm Dan, as always, alongside Matt. I might sound a little bit different this week. I'm actually not in Calgary in my studio. I'm in BC. And Matt, I decided since the Canucks seem to have the Oilers kryptonite, I've traveled to BC so I can see what I can learn from the Canucks to take back for the outdoor game this week. Well, you see, the Winnipeg Jets gave us a bit of a hand. that They already took out McDavid for the next week, so... Don't have to worry you about know, him. You know that I'm going to charge this uh, this whole trip to the show. It's a scouting trip. Yes. So, how are you doing, Matt? Oh, pretty good. Um, the Flames, not so much this week. Uh, they had a very difficult road trip, but, you know, that's to be expected with a new coach. Only one day of practice before you could go out on the road, and then, like, five games in a week. It's hard to get all your ducks in a row when that happens. Well, before... Before we jump into those games, I just want to take a quick second to acknowledge there's a few people who mentioned that last week's podcast didn't come out on Monday as usual. They saw it on their podcast reader, but uh, there was no actual audio. That's been corrected. You should have been able to see it on Wednesday. We apologize for that. Just a technological glitch, but I've got it all sorted out now. I've wrangled the tech demons, and you can listen to that, and this week's show will be fine. So let's jump into the week, shall we, man? Yep. The Calgary Flames started the week uh, in Washington, taking on Alex Ovechkin and... I would say more than even Ovechkin taking on Matthew Phillips and company. Um, obviously Matthew Phillips gets his first NHL goal. Um, and the Capitals end up beating the flames three to two. We talked about Phillips last week. You got to be happy for the kid, but not the result we're looking for. No. And frankly, Washington is not a very good team anymore. And like, I wouldn't be surprised if they were in the bottom five to 10 in the standings at the end of the year. Uh, So walking away with only a single point in the shootout is not the ideal result against a bad team. But like the Flames were up by two when Phillips scored, and I thought, okay, that's fun. The kid got his goal against the Flames. Wonderful. Let's finish this off. And then it's like, uh, guys, hello. What's everybody doing? Yeah. Uh, and the second goal, yeah, that was not a very good goal, uh, even though it was deflected on the way to Markstrom, but... Things like that happen, and, you know, there was no real response from the team to get the lead back, and it, you know, frankly, it was a good thing that they managed to get a point, Uh, but, you know, just a disappointing effort, especially to set off uh, this week of four big games where, you know, like all of the teams that were, that the Flames faced this week were all teams that missed the playoffs last year. And, you know, they did not do well. (laughs) It's true. Very true. Um, And then the next game was against, like you said, another team who missed the playoffs. Calgary was able to figure out how to put their game together and end up winning 4-3 to against the Buffalo Sabres. Uh, Adam Rajichka gets the game winner here. We also get a goal from Walker Dewar, his first of the year, for a 4-3 win in Buffalo. Uh, This game was a game where... If the two goaltenders were playing decently, the score is probably going 0-0 into overtime. Um, yeah, uh, it was not a stellar performance for either Devin Levi or Dan Vladar. Um, it, and Vladar's first start of the season, too. Yeah, it was just one of those where our goalie made fewer mistakes than theirs did, and that that's pretty much how it is. Like, it, you know, neither... None of the seven goals, except for the tag Thompson goal on the in the over, uh, on the power play, that was the only one that looked like an actually decent scoring chance. The rest of them were like, "Oh, and they scored, cool." Uh, <laughs> you know, they they were none of them were, you know, like the prototypical like good finish, good passing play culminating in the tap in. It was like, okay, that puck went in, sure. And I think this game really showed that Buffalo is a team that's probably going to be in that upper, let's call it upper half of the Eastern Conference this year. Yeah, frankly, uh, Buffalo is probably going to be between 6 and 10 this year because there are so many teams that are kind of on that bubble um, in the Eastern Conference because there are just so many good teams in the East. But uh, where they end up, 
it, you know, it'll be up to their goaltending, I think, mostly, because their defense and forward group are pretty good. And then the next night, the Flames play their first back-to-back of the year in Columbus, taking on Johnny Goudreau and company. If we remember last year when the Flames were in Columbus, they didn't do well, and Daryl made some insinuations of some kind about the boys going to Johnny's house or, you know, something like that. Maybe it happened again, because uh, I don't think they looked all that ready here either in a 3-1 three, three to loss to the Blue Jackets. We'll talk about the hit a little bit later, but anything else about the game you want to chat about? Uh, no, it was uh, the standard Flames game against a mediocre backup goaltender where they make him look like a Vesna candidate. And, yeah. Uh, well, and, you know, like, Merlitzkins is a good goaltender, right? Like, if they were yeah. facing Merlitzkins, I could see that. Spencer Martin, like you said, marginal goaltender. When I saw he was in net and we had our starter in because we played with the first night, I thought, this should go the Flames' way. Yeah. And, you know, to credit Markstrom, he played well. Like, the, some of the saves he made in this game, especially the one on Fantilli, were great. And, you know, the, the Flames should have won based on the goaltending. Uh, there's just no finish amongst the Flames forwards, and yeah, another two points down the drain. And then we can talk about the hit here, as everyone's probably seen by the time you listen to this. If not, you can go find it on YouTube or TikTok, wherever you find your NHL footage. Uh, Rasmus Anderson laid a big hit on Patrick Laine and has been issued a four-game suspension. The Calgary Flames and the NHLPA will be appealing that, and we should know more Monday morning as to what happens there. Matt, when I watched it, it didn't look like a four-game suspension to me. How about you? I, If this was a hit that happened in the first period, probably a five-minute major in a game misconduct, and maybe a fine. Um, I, I've i seen so many hits that were worse than that, yet maybe a game or two. Yeah, and, and, and yes, it was charging. I'll admit it was charging. Yeah, oh, for sure, and... How would you say? I can understand where uh, Anderson's rationale for delivering the hit was, you know, because Laine was trying to basically dunk on the Flames after the game was basically already over. And, you know, and to be fair to Anderson, if Laine had not leaned back in anticipation of the hit, you could see that, like, Anderson's arm was down until he leaned, and then he kind of, like, fell into line A a bit. And, you know, it should have been a five-minute major in a game of misconduct. And I was expecting a game or two, maybe outside three, because Anderson has no reputation of doing this or track record of suspensions. But, like, a four-game suspension just seemed beyond the pale for the hit entirely. Um... It's just unfortunate because... And I could see if Line A was seriously hurt or was out. As far as I can tell, he's not hurt or out. Nothing's been announced there. Like, if the player was out, sure, I can kind of see, you know, and I even saw some chatter on Twitter saying, you know, if the player is out, you should be suspended as long as the player is out and things like that. But everybody got up. Everybody's going to play the next game. Like, four games seems a little steep. Yeah. Like, I saw somebody post a hit that uh, Jacob Truba hit through on uh, Timo Meyer in the playoffs last year. And, you know, like, he absolutely hammered him right in the face. And there wasn't even a penalty called. And, you know, like, if you're wanting headshots out of the game, sure. But, like, that, that play was also a borderline charge with a hit, hit directly to the head. Like, yeah. I, that's why I can see, like, a, a game or two, sure. But, you know, you have other players that do that. Like, you even look back to when the Flames played the Rangers last year and Truba's hit on Kadri. That was as bad as the Andersons' hit against Line. And yet, Truba didn't even receive a fine, nothing after that. And... You, you know, it, it's just the, the inconsistency from the NHL's department is the problem. Uh, and, like, to be fair, if you're wanting to get headshots out of the game, four games is entirely appropriate. But make it consistent where everybody's getting that penalty. Well, and that's something that the NHL's been accused of for years, right? Is that they hand out bigger penalties to those that go after star players than those that don't. And I think we could agree that Patrick Line and Timo Meyer probably aren't on the same level in terms of the league's view. So... Yeah, just be consistent. Mm -hmm. 
and make it known. If this happens, this will be the consequence. Yeah, like it doesn't matter who you are or who you hit, you're going to get a three or four game suspension if you target the person's head. Which then exactly. you you know you'll help cut that kind of hit out. But you know the the just up and down thing is what I don't agree with. Him getting suspended, yeah, sure, uh, entirely. So, so the way that this is going to work now is the NHLPA will have a hearing with the league. The Flames will have somebody there. The league will have somebody there. They will both present their arguments, which will go to Batman, and Batman makes a final decision. Because it's less than six games, Batman's decision is final. There's no way to appeal it. How do you think this one's going to go? Uh, probably he will get, serve the full four. You think so? Yep. I'd be shocked if they reduced it. As a Flames fan, it scares me because we're already short on the defensive side and I really don't want him out for four. And I think, and we'll talk about the next game in a minute, I think we really felt Rasmus Anderson not being there in the Detroit game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. So let's get to that one. The Calgary Flames, as we record this on October 22nd, just finished a game with the Detroit Red Wings in Detroit and lost 6-2. to two. And this was... This was not the score I was expecting from this one, Matt. Um, frankly, I kind of was. Um, Detroit has a fast team, and the Flames' defense without Anderson is not very good. So them giving up a ton of chances and goals, I'm not exactly surprised. Yeah, I just wasn't, I don't know, like it seemed as though, and, and it's something that we, we've we talked about before, but it seemed like the Flames got down, and they were down by two, and they came back, and it's like, okay, you know, there's a bit of a fighting chance, and even when it was, you know, four to two, they actually got some goals, and it's like, okay, they can, they've drawn within striking distance, but near the end, it just looked like things unraveled, and I think we've seen that a few times this week. Yeah, and... um. Well, how do you say that the main problem that the Flames as a group have is they just do not have a lot of finishers on the team. And like the guy, the two guys with the best shots on the team are Andrew Mangiapane and Matthew Coronado, um, with Elias Lindholm being in that same, close to the same group. And none of those guys you would think of as your, you know, leading goal scorer guys you know like they're all decent secondary scoring threats and that unfortunately is where the flames are running into trouble against all the teams that they've played thus far is that they're not getting enough finishing from everybody else that's not those three guys because you know they, they just don't have the weapons to do so yeah, and, and we've talked about this before, and I think, you know, as this season's progressing, I'm staying with my thoughts. I think that if the Flames are successful this year, it's going to be because of a, you know, sort of a collective. One or two guys are not going to go out there and score all the points for the Flames this year. They're going to need 12 forwards and six defensemen to all be firing on all cylinders. Yeah, and realistically, you know, if that doesn't turn out, like, that's not the worst-case scenario either because... Uh, you know, how would you You've say? You've talked a oh, lot about this. We won't go down that road. Yeah. Again, but. Well, how would you say? Most of the time, when you're looking for a dyna dynamic scorer, you know, you need to draft that guy. So, either which way, you know, there is a solution for the problem. It's just how it unfolds and which makes more sense at which time. Is. We'll go further down that road later in the season once we start oh, to yeah. figure out who these guys are. Oh, for sure. So as of right now, the Calgary Flames sit 10 in the we 10th in the West, 4th in the Pacific Division. They've played 6 games. They're 2, 3, and 1. So 2 wins, 3 losses, 1 overtime loss for 5 total points. The teams that are above us are LA tied for 5 points, Vancouver at 6, the Golden Knights at 12, and of course, Matt, my favorite part, the Oilers below us at 3. Yep. Well, and especially um, speaking of the Oilers, um, a, a number of years ago, you and I were talking about how it was a dumb idea to play McDavid and Drysaddle for 28 minutes a night every night. Uh, those chickens are coming home to roost. Uh, McDavid's out so for, for the, yeah. For those that don't know, in the Winnipeg game, McDavid got injured, and you know, Matt, I've been saying for years as well, not only playing them together, but McDavid's getting older. I mean, he's you know mid 20s now, and you might go oh, mid 20s, not old. Everybody especially big players, have a significant injury at some point. The older you get, the more susceptible you are. We all remember Crosby's concussion and things like that. 
you know, McDavid's finally, I think, I, I hate to say this, but getting maybe what's due. Yeah. Well, especially He's been when. very healthy. Well, especially when you're playing that many minutes, like just natural wear and tear, you're going to be burning out more of your body just doing the normal things. And where a rather innocuous hit by uh, Josh Morrissey ended up knocking him out of the game and. You know, now it's looking like uh, two weeks or so uh, that he'll miss. And, like, frankly, the Oilers do not have the depth or the talent to be able to eat that for an extended period of time. So it'll be interesting to see how they fare over the next couple of weeks. For sure, yeah. And, I mean, that we'll talk about it more when we preview next week, but that could be very good for us come, uh, you know, the, the Heritage Classic on the weekend. So... A couple things I wanted to talk to you about. Um, let's go this way first. The Calgary Flames have had a couple games. You know, the Washington one comes to mind, and even a few before this week, where they're getting up. They're the, getting the lead, and then they're somehow blowing it or letting it go. And this is not a new thing for the Calgary Flames. This is something we've seen, you know, as they say in Beauty and the Beast, a tale as old as time. It's frustrating to still be seen, or at least for me, to still be seeing the same behaviors. Like we're being told there's a new team, they've got a new system, they got a new structure. And yet, you know, when you're getting a two goal lead and you're blowing that, that doesn't tell me that a lot has changed here. No, and th- that's both talent and it happens to talent everybody, and, but yeah. we're, we're six games in and I'd say it's happened three games already. Yeah. Well, it's both a talent problem and a commitment problem. Um, like you see, like in the game against Detroit, for example, everybody on that team was skating hard all game for Detroit and they, they eased up after it was six to two, because why would you keep pushing at that point? But, you know, like the flames very rarely do they ever have a stretch of time where they're consistently putting forth that effort. We saw that a bit in the Pittsburgh game and a bit in the Washington game in the first period, but it's very few and far between. And like when they're not doing that, they're just bad. Yeah, I I think, you know, and, and I don't know, and maybe we'll get into this another time if we want to really dive into it, but I don't know what needs to change there. Is that personnel? Is that, you know, some between their ears? I don't know why multiple iterations of this same team have been having the same struggles time in and time out. Well, and that's where, you know, like, it, how would you say, you kind of have to transition this team, whether the regardless of the, the success of the team on the ice or not, you know, like transitioning players like how we saw to fully leave to get Sharon Govich, but allowing the space for Coronado to play into fully spot. And, you know, like we're going to have to see more of that over the next couple of seasons, just filtering out some of the more veteran guys for more of the younger guys and how they go about that, whether it's let just letting people walk as free agents or making trades or whatever the permutation well, is. And a lot of the veteran guys are very, you know, are locked up with very big contracts here. And that's not a bad thing. Um, you know, like I know a lot of people complain about Kadri and Huberto eating so much cap, but realistically, who on the free agent market, A, is worth that, um, and B, it's not like the Flames have an impending RFA guy who's also worth that much at where it's causing a problem and not yet but if you want to go down the rebuild route you're going to need money soon for some of these guys and if you've got you know six years on cadre that is going to handcuff you at some point i think we even saw that when we had you know johnny and um you know matthew gachuk coming up that because of some of those long-term deals it did handcuff them when they needed the money yeah and you know and like if the flames do struggle just as a hypothetical, um, you can have a guy or two or three with that kind of a level of play where they're just there eating more of your cap than you'd like uh, until you can eventually trade off that player. But like when there's a year or two left on that tra- deal, but it, it's one of those where like if the flames are going to go that, that, 
quasi-rebuild route. Like, it's not like it's going to be happening overnight anyway. And, like, it's going to take three or four or five seasons, even if they're trying to be competitive while rebuilding, to actually be able to transition from, like, the older guard to the newer guard anyway. Yeah, no, I get what you're saying. And I don't know if I want to go down that route today and discuss that, but let's let's table that for once we know what this team is. Because right oh, now, yeah. I mean, they're they're four in the Pacific. They're, you know, they're not doing terribly six games in. And I think that this team can still turn itself around. Oh, for sure. Same here. It's just, uh, like how, how would you say, it, it, because of like the pent up conversations we've had about Lindholm and Hannafin and, like Hannafin, apparently, according to Elliot Friedman, is getting closer to a contract extension. Like all of those things are still kind of churning. Like even though it, like we're now into the season, like it's kind of still trying to figure out exactly where does this team actually go and how do they get there. Um, so it's you know, like even though it is only six games in, it's still kind of a discussion topic. Even though, yeah, I just I wanna I don't wanna you know. Go, go too far. The fantasy fantasy GM piece of tearing this team apart until we know what they are. Oh no, I agree. But one thing I do want to discuss, um, Dan Vladar. We've played f- six games. Vladar has started two of those games. So really, I mean, he started you know a third of the games the Flames have played. He has one win, one loss. To me, that's more than I would have expected him to start so far. How about you? About about on par. Um... Uh, you know, like I'm expecting him to play about 25 to 30 games this year, which if you break that down, it's about right. How do you think he's done so far? Not good. <laughs> Decidedly I, not good. <laughs> and I think we have to look there to it. I mean, there's a guy again who hasn't had a lot of NHL play time. I still think Dan Vladar is a, can be a good goaltender. I think he's sort of like a David Riddick where we're not sure if he's a starter or a backup. That's got to be seen. Um, but I think... Dan Vladar just needs more playtime. And I think not being under Daryl Sutter, we're going to see that. And I like that they put him in against Detroit because that should have been a game that they should have been able to win, in my opinion, with either goalie. And I think you need Vladar to get some more early season starts to really make sure he's ready to go. Yeah. And, you know, it, with how the schedule for the start of the year is mostly Eastern Conference teams at using Vladar more, where even if you drop the game, it's not the end of the world whereas if you're like dropping the Edmonton game it's a little bit more <laughs> harmful to you so yeah and, and I think even outside of the Eastern Conference stuff the Flames have a lot of rest this first month like even if we take a look at you know next week or this coming week um, you know the Flames play today on Sunday they don't play again till Tuesday and then they play Thursday at home and then they have two game two days off in a game then another two days off you know, and another game, then another two days off and another game, another two days off and two games, another two days off and a game. Like, you know, it's not the every other schedule like we we would normally think of. And I think as a head coach, when you see a schedule like that, the temptation is, okay, go with the starter. We can rest him. But my thoughts there would be, you know what, let's play Dan Vladar more. And if we can get, you know, Markstrom four or five days of rest and still play Vladar, like, you know, we'll talk about this later uh, when we get to our season, our weekly preview. The Flames have two games at home in five days. I would probably play Vladar in at least one of those. And if you play him in St. Louis, you can get, you know, a good four days of rest for Markstrom. Yeah, exactly. Because you kind of have to pencil Markstrom in for the outdoor game. So sure. uh, you just kind of have to back your way up from that. And, you know, having him play against the Rangers and the Oilers makes the most sense with Vladar getting the Blues. Yeah, and even again, if we go into November, you know, I could see him, uh, Vladar, playing either Dallas or Seattle. Um, you know, I could see him playing Nashville. He'll probably play one of the two back-to-backs, Toronto, Ottawa. Then we got Montreal with two days and one day on the other side. Like, I think that the beginning of the season is primed and set up for, you know, both goalies to get some chance and to get some rest. And I think even early on, if you can give Lillard going, it's really going to help the team down the stretch when Markstrom's going to be tired, when the season's in a clutch and you know, okay, we know what we have out of both guys. And I think, and I don't want to say they're going to call up Wolf, but I think it also gives them a look at, okay, we've given Markstrom, say, five games in the first month or six games in the first, call it month, two months of the season. Is he the right backup or is that Wolf's spot? 
Yeah, and like if Ladar, say he continues to struggle through the end of November, then I think you make the switch, and especially because Wolf's been playing really well down on the farm. Yeah, I don't think you necessarily make a switch because I don't think Ladar clears waivers, but I think you make a deal. Yeah. Well, that's what like I meant. I think that's switch, what I, I meant like by one a switch. to the AHL, yeah. one to the NHL. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, and and I again, I'm you've everyone who's listened to this podcast for a while knows I'm not one who wants to rush AHL players, especially goaltenders. But I think the Flames have to figure out what Dan Vladar is right now. And you know, maybe I mean, there's always goalies, you know, on waivers and stuff like that. And you know, even if they don't go with, even if they don't go with Wolf, and they say, hey, we want Wolf in the AHL. Even if you were to get another goalie, either you know UFA or waivers, son, and you say, hey, he's a better, cheaper option, or as good a cheaper option, and he'll work for the rest of the year. But I think they just need to get Dan Vladar going. I still, I still have great faith in Dan Vladar to be, I don't think a starter for this team anytime soon, but I still have faith that he can be a good, you know, strong backup one B type guy. Yeah, and it's one of those where. Between how Markstrom and Vladar are playing, will kind of de- tell you like what the future is for those two guys. And Markstrom, to start the year, has been excellent in each of his starts. Still gives up the odd bad goal, but uh, I think pretty much every goal he does at some point. And it, it's one of those where you know if Marks or Vladar can elevate his game to play on par with marks from then great uh if he continues to falter then you know at least the flames have a viable third option instead of just... and to be honest it's not like dan Villar has been the only guy in those games that didn't look good oh no you know we've seen times when the whole team has looked good and the goalies let them down i think you know there's a lot of guys that need to get their season legs under them and dan Villar is just one of many yeah for sure I've also heard fans talking so far, again, six games into an 82-game schedule, about disappointment in Jonathan Huberto and, you know, Jonathan Huberto not playing well. Um, to me, sort of like the whole team, I'm not worried about him yet. Yes, he's maybe slow getting started. We all love Jerome, who never got started until Christmas time. Are you worried about Huberto right now? Uh, not really. Um He's always been one of those players where he just kind of looks... Like, he's there, and then all of a sudden you look at the end of the night and he has five points, or four points, and it's like, what? <laughs> you know, yeah. and he, you know, he's very deceptive, and part of the problem is is that he does not really gel on with his line mates, and, like, it, you saw in the Detroit game that the Flames switched up the lines because uh, him with Manjapani and Lindholm was not really clicking they ended up putting him on a line with Cadre and Dubé. Yeah, and it's one of those where uh, the Flames need to find people that work well with Huberto in whatever formula that it end up, ends up working. It's just, for right now, it's just being tough right as we're, you know, six games in. And, uh, you know, you and I had the debate when we did our sort of season predictions about how many goals or points is Huberto good for this year. And I asked, could he be a point per game player? Right now, the Flames have played six games. He's got four points. Like, to me, that's kind of where I expect him to be. You know, yeah, he could maybe he could have eight, maybe he could have six. But, you know, you're almost on point for, you know, point per game there. Like, yeah. you know, he's got two goals, two assists, four points in six games. So could he have more? Sure, but I'm not worried about four points six games in. No, and you have to look at like the whole Flames team. Like it's not like you have some players just lighting it up. Like it, it's been. It's not like Walker Dewar's got twelve points and he's got four. No, it, the whole team is very mediocre offensively to start the season, and it, it's hard to put huge numbers on the board when the whole team is struggling to even buy a goal, let alone multiple in a game. For sure. Yeah. It's, you know, it's something where this team needs to, 
it, it's like the musketeers, right? All for one, one for all. In order for them to have success, everybody needs to start doing it. And we are seeing some positive things. You know, I think Mangiapane's look good so far. I think, you know, Dubé's look good. There's a number of guys that have. There's nobody I'm really worried about yet. Yes, there's some guys that maybe aren't doing as well as I thought. I don't know about you, but there's nobody really that I'm looking at going, eh, this guy's really gotten a really lousy start here. Yeah, it's pretty much everybody's within the range of what expectations were, give or take. But, um, no, and you look at um, the team as a whole, and it, going back to last season, like the Flames were pretty much dead last in the NHL in generating high-danger scoring chances and medium-danger scoring chances while being one of the elite in the low-danger chances. And... You know, like, uh, through six games, the Flames are 26th and 26th and 4th in those categories. And it's like, well, gee, you're not getting to any of the dangerous areas to actually shoot the puck. And then you're wondering why you can't score. So, it, it's, and that's a personnel problem. That's not a coaching problem because the system is trying to feed pucks into those areas. It's just the personnel is not getting with the memo if we're having the same discussion every week between now and christmas i have worries yeah right now well, you know what everybody has a bad week and the way i look at it i mean the first game we're you know pretty happy with i think um you know the, yeah the second game they lost i didn't think it was terrible that uh that pittsburgh game and then they've gone on a on a long road trip and I think, you know we often say it's time to go on the road i just feel like right now it's time to come home and we'll see what they can do well, and that's the thing. Like, it's hard for teams because, like, on the road, you can't really practice properly. And what's most difficult is a team that has got a new system, you know, new personnel, new, you know, trying to make a new identity and then not being able to practice for two weeks. And, you know, it's tough. And I, I'm sure that, like, when they get home and are actually able to schedule proper practices again, that things will, you know, they can actually work on the things that have crept up that they're deficient in, but we'll Assuming see. Assuming they go to Edmonton the day of the Heritage Classic, which is often how it goes, that gives them six days at home and two games. So lots of time on ice if they want it. Yeah. Let's talk about that Heritage Classic. We won't give our predictions yet, but I have mixed feelings about the Ardor game. The Flames have played two. They're one and one. They we know how the uh, we know how the how the Battle of Alberta has gone the last couple of years. Are you excited about this one? Uh, I'm kind of mildly indifferent. Um, how did you say the the outdoor games kind of are getting a little old for me? I'm not like the first one that we were in with the Montreal being here in Calgary. That was a very fun experience to go to, but like it was the, new, yeah. But, like, the one in Winnipeg, it's like, I watched the game because, I, you know, the Flames were playing. But, like, if it was some generic teams playing outdoors, it would be like, yeah, and, like, I don't care. And, yeah, and, and without the without the also the alumni game, without a lot of the festivities. I mean, you remember, you know, the first outdoor game we had the AHL game as, or the WHL game. Sorry, like, without a lot of the festivities, this one doesn't feel as special to me. No, it's like that was actually the one of the most fun parts of the outdoor game was like seeing all the alumni playing against each other the day before and even if they don't want to do the alumni game outside and the league has said they don't want to ruin the ice do it inside like you know play it on the oilers ice i don't think that game needs to be on the outdoor ice to be fun no it, it should how would you say it should have more of like the all-star game feel to it yeah. without being the all-star game and yeah. even that, you know, the last time they were here, they played an AHL game in the Dome. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't on the outdoor ice. It was in the Dome, but it was still a lot of fun because it was something we didn't get to see. Yeah, I agree. And it's and Edmonton doesn't have their farm team there. Haul them in, bring the Wranglers in. Like, it, it just feels like, you know, the, the Canadian one this year has become second rate. Yeah, exactly. There's no anything except for the outdoor game, which, you know, it... It is what it is. Like it's kind of a lousy game to watch on TV for one. 
I'm it's... not a fan of either uniform. Like I'm not, you know, looking forward to seeing either team in their uniform. To me, and, and I think you kind of said I, it earlier, I, I it like the like... and to me, like the Flames jersey actually looks decent compared to the Oilers jersey. Like that is a monstrosity compared to the Oilers jersey. But even then, I'm not a fan of the. I mean, the Flames definitely have the better of the two. Yeah, but yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it just, I don't know, it kind of feels like the outdoor gimmick is wearing off. If if they want to do something where every team played outdoors once a year or something, fine. But it, it just feels like the specialness of the outdoor game is wearing off. And while I think it's cool, and I might feel different if it was in Calgary, but while it feels cool, I was excited when it was first announced. As we've sort of seen it roll out, I'm becoming less and less excited. To me, it just feels like another game. Yeah, pretty much. And, you just know, with I mean, special it, it, jerseys, which... Okay. Special jerseys, Markstrom have a toque on. Like we kind of know those gimmicks already, right? Like the goalies will wear a toque and that sort of thing. Like it's, I don't know. It just feels like there's a script for these games already. Mm. You know, usually the coaches are wearing like a bomber jacket or a, you know, like a Letterman jacket. Remember that year they all wore like pork pie hats. Like I don't know. It just, it, it, it doesn't feel as special as it used to. Yeah, I agree. Well, Matt, anything else uh, from this week that you want to cover about the Flames? Not really. It was just a hard week, and you could see the team struggling quite a large amount, and them just not really being on the same page with each other, which, you know, when you only have a couple days of practice before the season starts, it's, you know, like it's hard to get all your ducks in a row uh, early. And that's why I was kind of, like, last week I was kind of saying, alluding to, the, like, expecting a bad start for this team. And it just because of the fact that they're on the road and, you know, learning a new system. And, like, those things just always tend to hit a team uh, that's changing things Not up. Not only on the road, on the road in the east. Like, you know, even if you look at their schedule, they went from Buffalo to you know, Ohio in one night, that's not an easy trip to do in the middle of the night to get your sleep in there. Like, you know, they've been moving a lot. Yeah, I agree. And it, it's hard when, you know, you're trying to basically get over what happened last season, get, find yourself a new identity in a new system where the way you make passes and like how the offensive system set up and how the defensive system set up, are completely different and yet do this without practice and you know like five games in like eight days and you know <laughs> okay yeah and get all that done all this every game i've seen things i think okay there's something here they can work oh i on agree this. they can tweak this like there's been there hasn't been a game yet that's been a real stinker even the detroit game i looked at it and said there's room for improvement here yeah, it's, and there's good things take away from it. Mm -hmm. It's there hasn't been one where their heads been shoveled in like yeah, the Vancouver game last year where they lost like seven nothing, or the Vancouver Oilers game, which is why I'm in BC to study to yeah. find out what secrets I can take back. You know, like yes. that. Van the Oilers had no no hope. Yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see, like especially as they get home for the next little stretch, to see like once they can actually practice how the various players respond to the, all of the things. And even just sleeping in your own bed. Mm -hmm. Well, Matt, last week we didn't do well with our predictions. I thought that the Flames would win Washington, Buffalo, Detroit, and lose Columbus. You thought they'd win Washington, Detroit, lose Columbus, Buffalo. They only won against Buffalo, so neither of us did well there. No. Uh, you ready to make – You ready? To, I got my predictions for this week, but are you ready to make yours? Sure. Before we go there, let's just run through the schedule. The Flames, as we mentioned, are back home. Uh, they have a day off Monday, and then they'll play Tuesday, the 24th, in the Saddle Dome. Weird start time, 7.45. I can't remember the last time I saw a 7. We've seen like 7.30 starts, but I can never remember 7.45 p.m. start Mountain, and that'll be in the Dome on Tuesday. And then on Thursday, they play the St. Louis Blues, 7 p.m. start time Mountain time. They get... Uh, Friday, Saturday off, and then they'll make a quick road trip up to Edmonton for the Heritage Classic on Sunday, and we'll record after that Heritage Classic game. So why don't I give you my thoughts first on this one, Matt? Go right ahead. I feel like I'm channeling you this week. Um, I think the Flames beat the Oilers. They l lose to New York and St. Louis. 
Okay. Um, I was actually going to go in the exact opposite direction. I think they'll beat the Rangers and the Blues and lose to the Oilers. Wow, you're the optimistic one this week. Yep. Um, like, to me, this Oilers game, while not a must-win on the schedule at this point, feels like you've got to start the Battle of Alberta off strong. Yeah. As, uh, but frankly, like, it's getting into Anaheim Ducks territory in the Honda Center where, you know, like, they're not going to have McDavid. Like, they realistically, they should win that game. But you you just know that, like, Dryside will end up getting, like, three goals and Hyman will get two just because, of course. <laughs> or something yeah, and, stupid and like and that. And, you know, unlike the Honda Center, though, it's not just in Edmonton's building. Like, they can't seem to beat them in our building either. No. So I, I'm hoping that with McDavid out, that's why I said the Flames will win that one. And we don't even know how long McDavid's out for, but assuming he's out, I think the Flames will win that. But I think you're going to spend the week getting hyped up for that one. And I think that, especially with the two days rest, I don't know what Edmonton's schedule looks like, but I think especially the two days rest and a short trip to Edmonton. Like, it's not like, you know, they've got to travel across the country. I think the Flames can be good and ready for this one. Let's just say if the Flames lose this, I think it'll be on their own merits. Yeah, I agree. You know, you can't blame scheduling, you can't blame travel, you can't blame, you know, a lot of those things. Um, I think Rasmus Anderson will probably be back by then. That's just my hunch. Um, but that could play a big factor in it as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I do have one question for you. Do you see, sure. like, now that they're back in Calgary uh, after tonight's game, um, do you expect them to make a recall for either Soloviev or Poirier? I don't know if they do it tonight. I think they'll wait until the hearing tomorrow because if Raz comes back, I don't think so. I think if you're going to pull a guy up, I would probably pull up Soloviev just because he had the better training camp and probably deserves the shot a little bit more. Um, but I don't think so for the home games. I think they'll run with who they've got for the home games unless there's another injury. I could see them taking Soloviev to Edmonton, though. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, I just, I, I think part of the benefit of having the farm team here is you don't need to pull guys up. I also don't know when the Wranglers play. Like if the Wranglers don't play till the weekend, sure, pull a guy up because you're not taking them out of the AHL lineup, right? Yeah. So I, th I think there's a lot of things that go in there. But if it's one of those two, I think it's Soloviev. Who do you think it is? Uh, I might actually defer to Poirier uh, just because of his very hot offensive start. He has seven points in four games thus far. And actually leads the AHL in scoring. Wow. Yeah, then maybe maybe he comes up. Or you know what, maybe, I don't know, do you bring them both up um, and bench an NHL or I don't think so. But I think if nothing else, if you're Gilbert and Osterley, now's your chance to really prove why you should stay in the lineup. Yeah. And you hopefully... Know, and, and no I think for both those guys, it's an opportunity. Yeah, I agree. And it's one of those where it'll be up to those guys to you know, keep a spot as like the number seven or the number six even. Well, that's it. We have a six spot open, right? So I think, um, I think one of those guys can prove why they're better than the other. So Matt, I think, uh, I think that's probably about it for this week. Yep. And a very short week, uh, in terms of content, mostly because like all the games kind of felt similar, even though the results weren't always the same. Um, and just a lot of uh, questions yet to be answered about how, who is this iteration of the flames for sure. Yeah. And you know, I think as we talked about this week's going to be an international one to watch, cause I think we'll get a better sense of that moving forward. Yeah. Cause like if we're talking about like the exact same things next week, then that kind of gives you some answers in and of itself. Well, let's see how things go, Matt, and I, uh, I look forward to talking to you after the Irish Classic. And as always, go Flames, go! Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.